ready to roll. Coaches ready. So uh, I, I don't think we have any club business to talk about in a regular meeting. So we're going to jump right into our presentation. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough at our uh, banquet to sit next to Paige, and he volunteered to talk about his accomplishments and his, some of uh, the details of his thousand-kilometer flights. And uh, uh, I immediately said yes. I didn't hesitate on that one. Really, really want to hear from Paige and. Uh, very much appreciate you coming out and, okay. and talking to us. Yeah, so. thank you. So yeah, so I uh, didn't spend too much time putting these slides. So uh, uh, what that means, I would like to make it a little bit interactive, and there are some things that I don't cover that much. But um, the, the idea is, uh, I'm going to talk about a thousand kilometer soaring flights out of Boulder. Uh, tell you all my secrets. The secret is there are no secrets. <laughs> uh, I want to do a brain dump <laughs> and uh, just in time for the best part of the season. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so the, and uh, what I'm going to talk about really holds true for pretty much any long flight. Uh, uh, but um, um, yeah, it, and there are some bolder specifics uh, and. Uh, Hopefully that's going to be obvious. I'll try to point out some of those things. Um, but uh, it's uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, is generally true, and it's really what I do. It's I mean there is no not one way to do it, but this this is like uh, my uh, what, what what I learned and how I do it and how I go about it. Um, and stop me at any time if you have any questions. So let's. Uh, Let's just uh, jump in. So uh, this is what the uh, overview of my presentation. And it, I suspect it may go for an hour or probably maybe even more. Is everyone OK with that? Bring it on. OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll cover the list of all the 1,000 kilometer flights and look at statistics. Um, then uh, talk about just general problem, what we are trying to optimize, and then talk about uh, some of the key factors, equipment, pilot, weather, plan, and challenges, and then tips, uh, tips and tricks, that's uh, just the general throw it all, everything that uh, came to my mind that I didn't put in any other uh, category. So um, let's just go up. Uh, so this is a list of flights. Again, it's a small uh, resolution is not great, but uh, this is all the thousand kilometer flights out of Boulder and um, I included like this one and this one which are not quite thousand kilometers but for all the practical purposes they are like thousand kilometers so ju just because they they actually fit the same pattern they are they're less than 50 kilometer short uh, but these are all the flights uh, so there are uh, the first thousand kilometer flight was done by John Seaborn in 2004 and um, these are not only thousand kilometer flights out of Boulder, these are thousand kilometer flights out of Colorado. There are no other thousand kilometer flights anyplace in Colorado. So we are the ones that are doing it. So John was the first one to do it in 2004 and that was like a, a really big deal because no one has ever done it before. And um, so now it's 2019. Um, and if you look at this list of flights, uh, so from roughly, uh, well, 2011, maybe there was one year that there was, up, up until now, that there were no thousand kilometer flights. But John Seaborn did twice, uh, thousand kilometer twice. Bob Carl did it once. Uh, I did it 18 times. This is minus two to remove those which are not quite. Bob Ferris did one, and uh, Bob Caldwell did one. So, so John, Bob's, and myself are the ones that did them. And so these are statistics. So this is the date. And so let, let me talk about this. So this is the glider uh, handicap. This is the actual distance. This is the speed for that distance. And we, what we are talking here is uh, OLC type of flight, which is a six segment type of flight. Uh, so, um, and I'll talk more about that. 
and then a uh, triangle, that's how big of a triangle it was. Uh, two and a half hour uh, speed, that's like the speed league on OLC. Uh, so that's this column. Uh, these ones didn't really have uh, uh, that's statistics and I didn't bother to calculate it. Uh, duration is the duration of the flight. So this is the actual flight duration, the first column. The second one is the duration of the flight on task, after start until finish. Uh, Takeoff time, landing time. Uh, this is um, uh, average thermal uh, climb and the uh, average glide, uh, L over D. And uh, a percent thermaling, so like th this one uh, was 23% of time John was thermaling at uh, on average uh, 5.8 knots and he was gliding at 1 over 50. And uh, whether ballast was used, so 100% of time, so, so some flights have it less than 100% of time. Um, and then just a general comment, and then this column is the one that I like a lot, and that's essentially uh, my very subjective um, score of the flight. Uh, so, was it an epic flight or was it a wimpy flight on that scale? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, there is also, uh, I'll send a, a link to this spreadsheet so people can uh, look you. at it. Uh, if I may? Yes. How does a thousand kilometer flight get enough? Uh, on a relative scale, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, and I'll show you actually. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and then the link on Glideport, so that you can uh, click and actually um, see the flight, the, the trace. The other link is on uh, OLC. So let me. So this is. Oh, I don't know. <coughs> uh, oh I, I'm not logged in. Uh, Okay, let, let me pick another one that I don't have to log in for. Uh, uh, I don't know. Let, let's look at this one because and this is an A. Uh, so he, here is the flight. So, so this is essentially Santa Fe and back out of Boulder. And so, so, so that, that's that link. Um, and the bottom is here and all of that. So, so this is just the standard glide port uh, stuff. Uh, let me go back, um, and th then OLC link, so that's, uh, that's what it is. So now uh, let me point out a few things. Uh, so first one was 2004, then Bob did it, um, and uh, he actually did uh, fly pretty fast, on the, almost 150 kilometers an hour for the whole flight, and that was border to border plus, I think he went all the way to Taos. Uh, into New Mexico, but then uh, going north, he went to Wyoming and back. And then I did it 2008, and that was in Ventus 1, 15-meter uh, configuration, 100% uh, water. Then um, this is the only one that didn't use any water, which now, uh, looking from this perspective to me, that, that's quite amazing. Um, but you can sort of see, um, really, this one had a really good uh, very much uh, higher relative average climb, but really much lower glide. So this this one has the uh, so so the highlights in the spreadsheet uh, signify minimums and maximums. So this one had the lowest glide interthermal, and this one had the highest glide on average. And uh, this one had, for example, John's flight had the highest uh, thermal climb. Uh, and uh, and so on. That's so average throughout the flight. Throughout the flight, wow. six point eight. But uh, you see, see, like this one is the lowest. So I, I did it actually with only four point four mm -hmm. average. Uh, and um, uh, what what else? Uh, and so if you go through the columns, the fastest one for the whole. Uh, I mean, this is 1,100 kilometers, was 158 kilometers an hour. And the fastest two and a half uh, hour segment on any of these flights is 180, and this was. Um, so, and this is probably, uh, I, I bet this was probably a very long downwind lag or something like that. Uh, and then you can see, I mean, the shortest one uh, was actually only a little over seven hours on course. 
and then the longest one was uh, uh, where is the longest one? Let me uh, hold on. Uh, I, so, uh, ten hours and eleven minutes uh, for for the whole flight, uh, and then um, the latest takeoff, which is really quite amazing, was like 20 minutes to noon yeah. and flying without water. So that, that, that was actually pretty good. <laughs> actually managing to, to make that happen. Um, the, the earliest launch I think it did, yeah, it was uh, 9.50 essentially. And the latest landing was uh, eight, almost 8.30 before sunset, I mean when the days are long. So um, the least amount of thermaling was 18% and the uh, most thermaling uh, is 31. And then the notable things, uh, yeah, like um, uh, there, there is a year, I mean, uh, uh, that, that uh, 2015, uh, nothing happened. I, I did have some flights, but notably, uh, I don't really remember because that whole year is a blur to me. I mean, my son got born, so <laughs> probably that also interfered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, like uh, last, uh, this is last year, so this is the lar uh, largest triangle, which is just under a uh, thousand kilometers. And so large tri triangles are really hard to do around here. Um, what else? Uh, oh, and there are a bunch of days, like 2016, there was a really, really good day uh, when two Bobs and myself did the 1000K on the same day. So, so these three. Uh, and uh, the, I did the 1000K next day as well. So, so it w <laughs> they were back-to-back -back days. Why uh, didn't you get out of the plane overnight? <laughs> 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 and just to go over, so, so here is a table of uh, these statistics that you just looked at, so uh, minimum, maximum, and then you can see what the average is. So the average speed uh, for the whole flight is 130, but sort of uh, the slowest one is 120, and that's worth, uh, worth uh, no knowing when, you, uh, when you're planning. Um, and you can see, so average thermal, so you, it's kind of five knots range, but and then you're, you're gliding it on the average of one over 60. And uh, these are all a uh, little better than one over 40 gliders. Uh, so nominal event is one over 44. And so, uh, um, and then this is also interesting. So this is really the uh, histogram of when they were done. Uh, in the year, so you can see. Uh, so this is uh, none in April, early May, late May. So two in early May, uh, three in late May, and then June, as you would expect, it gets better. And then July, uh, early July is the best. Mm -hmm. And then until monsoon comes, and then pretty much everything stops. And then depending when uh, it ends, they typically get maybe another shot at it. And uh, there is this table that I'm going to talk about later. So, but that's that's really what uh, statistics are. So, all those flights are thermal flights. We don't uh, typically do uh, wave flights um, that are uh, really long. And just by the nature of uh, our mountain geometry, we don't get it. I mean, in, in these flights, I mean, you'd go into convergence and have a really nice lag or have even a wave, that, that, that's, uh, that's uh, not uncommon. And there are also no downwind flights and that's one thing I would like to do, but uh, it's really hard uh, just from logistic perspective. Um, uh, okay, and this I'll talk more. So, so that's really just the, uh, what we, again, Colorado flights, it happens that they are all out of Boulder. So what, what's the problem? What we are trying to do, it's really how do you fly a thousand kilometer flights 
but the OLC six lag, it's not a time lag, it's really, that's very specific. So that gives, uh, gives a, which really means it's not pre-declared, you just go and uh, decide what you're going to do in the, in the year. But there are, again, uh, it's a, such a long distance, so it does have uh, uh, lots of constraints. Now, uh, consider this. So this is like north and this is uh, south and this is Boulder and the mountains are here. So think of uh, you launch and you, you go into the mountains a little bit and uh, you go 25 miles uh, to the north. And then you fly first leg and you go to, uh, to 55 miles uh, south. And this is pretty much a beam Perry Park. And then you fly 110 miles to the back north. And uh, so you are basically a beam Owl Canyon. You're still in the mountains. So this is, uh, uh, what is it, the Halligan Reservoir? No, or Lake Cathy, yeah, I forgot. I mm -hmm. always keep mm -hmm. But yeah, a beam Owl Canyon. Mm -hmm. And you keep, keep doing that. Uh, and you finish 25 miles out. So when you add all of that distance, that's uh, essentially 600 miles. I I'm just going to be rounding numbers mm -hmm. just in the, so we are there in the rough order of magnitude. Okay. Now, the notable thing, 55 miles out, if you take um, 5 miles per thousand, which is 1 over 30, so this is uh, 11,000 feet that you need. So 11,000 feet at the far end out of Boulder plus 6,000 to be back at Boulder, that's 17,000. So 17,000, 17,000. So you can do a thousand kilometer as a local flight, never be outside the range of Boulder. <laughs> so, and that would, that answers your question, that would be my F flight. Okay. And that's actually on my list to do, to try to establish that uh, far end of Vimpy spectrum. <laughs> but it's actually hard, actually, because you have to be, uh, it's not just uh, go 55 miles out, it's really being within the glide range all the time. <laughs> So and th that's actually hard, hard, uh, not not easy. <laughs> so, but the, once you start thinking about this, it doesn't sound that that hard <laughs> anymore. Uh, so yeah, it can be a local hot flight. Um, so in the first order of ma uh, magnitude, so let, let's talk about the first principle. So if you're flying at 100 uh, kilometers an hour, uh, to do 1,000 uh, kilometers, you need, need 10 hours. So when you when we are in the middle of the summer, I mean, I mean you can launch, uh, you you can start your task at ten. I mean, there are many days when there is good lift already at ten, and you can fly until eight p.m. So no big deal. I mean, even if you fly hundred only, uh, your average hundred kilometers an hour, you you that can be done. Uh, then let's look at the climb. So six hundred miles. If you do five miles per of distance made per thousand feet of altitude, that gives you 120,000 feet of climbing that you have to do. So 120,000 feet of climbing at five knots, that, that's four hours of climbing. So you would be spending four hours just, just to get, in a sense, that fuel that you need to cover all of that distance. Now for cruise, so 600 miles, if you are cruising ground speed 100 miles an hour, uh, which is not really very fast. Um, uh, uh, no, that, 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 that's ground speed. So, so given our uh, density altitude, the, I mean our altitude and everything, that's probably, I don't know, 80-ish, uh, depending how high mm -hmm. you are, 80-ish indicated, maybe even 75. Mm -hmm. so, so that's not a problem, but uh, so so 600 miles at uh, 100 miles an hour mm -hmm. uh, average that, that gives us you six miles uh, six hours mm -hmm. of, of uh, cruising. So six plus four that kind of mm -hmm. you know, kind of matches that, and uh, yeah, so so no big deal. The uh, the actual average from that table is about uh, 1,050 kilometers in eight hours, and. Uh, uh, Climbing at five knots average for only hour and 45 minutes, a little less than uh, two hours, but that's because when you're cruising, you're cruising at one over 60. 
and it happens that that cruise was exactly at 100 miles an hour. So <laughs> the, 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 the numbers that they picked were, were cut out. So really, that's the problem. So uh, how do you do it? So what, what are the important factors? And these are the factors that uh, I consider really important, so everything that came to my mind. So equipment is uh, number one really important. So you have to have a glider that's good enough uh, to fly fast enough, and ideally a glider that, that can take water ballast. It's not necessary, but um, uh, that certainly helps because you're you are flying faster. Um, uh, but in there, there is uh, like club discuses or 505, they're, they're just perfectly capable of doing that. Uh, uh, so again, ballast is optional, not necessary, but it helps. Uh, it's important to have good instrumentation, obviously, to, uh, so uh, you know where you are, you know where, where you are going. Uh, uh, oxygen, uh, so all of those things are, um, you're going to be flying typically um, 14,000 and above. Uh, and uh, probably the uh, biggest uh, performance improvement uh, uh, is a, a good uh, system to any uh, good, good piece system to any glider. So th that's really important. And uh, pilot comfort is uh, uh, also important because you are going to, as you saw um, on every day, you're going to be spending eight hours there. So you really shouldn't feel uncomfortable or it shouldn't be draining you. <laughs> uh, it helps if you're thin so you can fit into an a cockpit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but the bottom line is you have to trust, uh, tr trust your equipment. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I have a little drawback there, but <laughs> it worked. <laughs> kind of figured out how to live with it. During a, uh, what would you recommend for a flight of, of eight to ten hours? Uh, in terms of food, water. Uh, well, uh, I typically uh, I'm pretty well hydrated before I get in cockpit, yeah. uh, and uh, I was going to talk about that. But then good, this is good. Uh, uh, let, let's talk about it now. So, so uh, I have a two-liter uh, Camelback that's behind my seat, and just it's uh, so it's, it's super easy. So. Um, uh, and um, I would typically, for eight hours, I would miss probably about, uh, I don't know, half a liter. So I typically take a little bottle in addition to that. That's what I consume, what my natural consumption is. So I'm not over hydrating myself. But the, the important part as far as water is also, uh, 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 again, you're at uh, altitude and all of that. So I also take salt pills because you're sweating and uh, so so like uh, what what endurance athletes would take. So, so that's really helpful. I don't take uh, Gatorade or anything like that. And that's too sugary. And, uh, but uh, salt pills actually help a lot. Mm -hmm. It keep, keeps you keeps you sharp. Uh, so, but the important thing about equipment is that everything should be really working. Small issues tend to have big impact in flight, and I, I think I done most of it. Uh, so I know about <laughs> those things. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah. So so. Uh, Try to take care of everything, uh, and so, so it should be in as perfect shape as you can get it for for your uh, so especially long flight. So next factor, uh, pilot, and the first uh, subcategory there is pilot skill. Um, so you should uh, you should get to the point where you are really very comfortable and you're pretty much on autopilot climbing and cruising. So you're not really thinking as much about uh, really, I mean, it's like driving your car. You are not thinking about it. You're doing small adjustment and just happening. Or like if you're stick shifting, you're not even thinking about how you're stick shifting, uh, but it's just happening. It's that level of uh, just uh, uh, basic skill that you need. Uh, you also need, again, if you're flying with water ballast, then you should be comfortable with that and be comfortable thermaling with water ballast and knowing how your glider behaves and all of that. Um, and uh, um, if you have a flat glider, uh, what you do, I mean, uh, I don't know uh, uh, how many, the very few people actually, I think, use flaps, uh, keep adjusting flaps when thermaling. I do that actually quite a bit. 
because that actually helps if you are, you know, I tend to be on the slower side of things and pretty steep. And if you ha get a little gust, uh, just putting it into a landing flap uh, really actually helps it if you're not uh, just chasing it. So, uh, so again, flying with, uh, and when you have water ballast, that actually becomes more of an issue. Uh, so as far as climb, um, um, again, important skills, finding thermals, not only thermals, but finding best thermals, picking the best thermals, uh, assuming you have an option of what, uh, what you're picking, but uh, that's another thing, uh, putting yourself in position so you have an option what to pick. Uh, but then uh, also finding best parts of best thermals um, and being in the very core. So in, in order to do that, you need to be really steep. I mean, it's uh, really unusual. I mean, if you're like 30 degree bank, you're not in it. You, 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 can, you can get another couple knots probably if you go to 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, moving, and the, the thermal is going to move, and understanding uh, really the, the structure and almost the texture of thermal and how it changes with altitude, that's, that's helpful. And again, as you're climbing uh, higher, and as it uh, widens and becomes larger, you, you, you can ease on, on the bank. But closer to the ground you are, uh, steeper you actually need to be because smaller it is. So, and and uh, you need to carry extra speed if you, I mean, if if you're like a uh, thousand feet above ground and you're trying to scratch out, obviously. But um, uh, then technique, speed control, again, talk, uh, so constant adjustment. Uh, so and no, no, I, I, I tend never to be satisfied where I am. And I always, uh, sometimes that's not that efficient because sometimes I would move myself out of it. Uh, and then having to, so, so I lose maybe 20, 30 seconds uh, having to come back and uh, so uh, almost the whole circle type of thing. And the typical circle, I mean, you, you would be uh, 25 seconds, that, that would be kind of on the average, between 20 and 30 seconds for, for per circle. Um, the, the other important uh, thing is um, uh, entering and leaving thermals, how you do it. Uh, again, if you have a flap ship, you're slowing yourself down with flaps, you're not yanking on the stick. Um, and uh, then you're doing a so, sort of opposite when you're coming down that, that actually works best for a flap ship. So you're you know, kind of squeezing all the performance. When you're pulling up and you're, uh, you, you, you don't really want to be uh, slowing down obviously uh, until you're in the thermal. You don't want to be anticipating and slowing down when you're uh, in sync um, that's around the thermal. Uh, obviously, need that. But uh, it's also when you are pulling in the thermal, when, when it hits that uh, gas, you're getting uh, two, two additional effects. You're getting a little bit of dynamic so soaring effect, and you're also accelerating yourself uh, to, this, to your climbing speed. So, so the glider doesn't, in a sense, you don't have, the thermal doesn't have to accelerate. So you're making that whole climb more efficient. And that's actually hard to always get right. But uh, uh, again, if you're trying to squeeze all the performance, yeah, the, those are uh, considerations. Uh, so now, as far as glide, um, know the optimal speeds uh, for your glider, for, for cruising. And I basically have three speeds in my glider like um, the default cruise speed, uh, super happy cruise speed, and uh, like, uh, oh, not so happy cruise speed, mm -hmm. and like 70, uh, so, so uh, and the slowing down to when, when I'm kind of sniffing for thermal with water, in, in my glider that would be 75-ish, um, 85 is not so happy. Uh, speed. If you slow down more, actually, uh, the performance difference. If you look at what the polar is, uh, the actual polar, there, there is. You're not losing that much between, like, uh, for those ten knots. Actually, it's uh, f uh, fairly flat at that point. Um, so, so that's a. Uh, it, it's a mistake to to fly too slow if you are uh, concerned, which is actually hard to do. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, my default speed would be 95-ish, and then happy speed is 105. That's in my glider. Uh, 
Uh, again, every glider is different. A and then do, uh, I do a lot of dolphining, and also I do a lot of, uh, when I'm just cruising, um, and I know I'm not going to stop there, I'm going for that cloud, but that kind of cloud is way out there. But I would be just thinking of geometry, how do I go uh, under that cloud so I get maximum distance under the part that I think is going to be lift, lifty. And so, so I slow, that, I mean, that's where I'm going 75-ish. And sometimes, I mean, if it's really good, I'd slow down even more. But, uh, but I would, typically, it's kind of, you turn into, you sort of uh, uh, approach it from uh, into the wind a little bit, kind of go diagonally. You don't really want to do too, too much deviation. But uh, you, you do want to do that uh, zigging and zagging. Uh, that, that helps, actually. And th that's why we get, uh, again, um, on average, I think it was uh, 1 over 60 and uh, 1 over 40 glider. Really. Are you uh, zigging, zagging more than you're actually circling? Uh, well, yeah, because uh, our, uh, I forgot what, it was 20 something percent of climbing versus the, the, uh, it's 77 uh, percent of cruising. Uh, so, really, in, in the first or three quarters to a quarter. So, three quarters of your time, you're, you're cruising and doing that zigzagging, almost, almost always, unless it's a blue hole that you have to cross, then that happens and then you're going to get um, really, depending on your altitude, the best, best speed for, for that situation. Uh, but uh, yeah, so again, finding best route and following convergence lines. Um, visual judgment when uh, gliding, so assuming no, no, no lift, uh, it's uh, really, uh, it's kind of game to play. You can always think, uh, if I go to that cloud, uh, given no lift, uh, at what altitude would I end there? So, th and then you can just play that with yourself and kind of figure out and uh, <laughs> kind of uh, learn about uh, what to expect. Uh, so, but the, the key thing is always staying in the good working band. And a lot of times in Boulder here, we have uh, uh, an inversion and um, above maybe 13, 5, 14,000, uh, things are absolutely amazing and great. And below that, I mean, it's just, it just sucks. And it's kind of hard to get into that band. And to get into that band, sometimes like going, starting early before all of that sets up, it kind of gets you to punch through and, but then you have to stay in it. And it's, it's, uh, th that happens, not that, uh, I mean, off. <laughs> and uh, the last one in the category of pilot skill, you should be comfortable landing out. So again, if you are, unless you are doing that uh, superb MP, 1000K. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, landing out, uh, again, n no big deal. And then um, um, you shouldn't be really fearing it. You should more think, uh, you, you, again, your skills should be at that level where you're not fearing it. You, you're thinking of it as an inconvenience with uh, some chance of happening. And that's the mindset that you should have and when, you, when you get into the cockpit because it's always a possibility. Yeah, how, how many times did you land out for those in, the, in that time period when you did all those? Uh, yeah, it, that, that's a good point, actually. I meant to mention that. Uh, this table that we looked at, they show the successful sure, thousand exactly. case. Uh, the, the unsuccessfuls are not shown, but uh, I, I would think, uh, well, uh, it's not that I just tried to do a thousand case, but uh, uh, depending on, like, I, think, I don't think last year, uh, I had any land outs, uh, but like flying out to Boulder, I mean, there were years that they had maybe two land outs, or uh, I mean, like landing out at Longmont and not, not mm -hmm. being, yet, so I wouldn't count that, but like landing in different places where you had to call someone mm -hmm. to, to get you. Um, yeah. So, but, so, so uh, I, I would say my average is probably once or twice a year, like closer to one. Uh, over, over, uh, over all, all of the time. So 20 successes and 10 to 15 landouts. Yeah, Something yeah, like yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, pilot experience, so safety. 
I put that in public experience because it's not really a skill, but that should be just there. And uh, what I, uh, the problem with safety is uh, that the bad behavior that you um, get away with actually reinforces doing more bad behavior. It's kind of, uh, that's how it is, but um, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> but uh, something it's hard to say, like especially when you are learning, is really what's uh, what's normal and what's nominal and uh, uh, what you sort of gotten away. Uh, well, I mean, it, and it's not that hard. I, I mean, if you have a plan B, which is a safe plan B, and th there was no concern, uh, and, and, th and you are on the only downside if things didn't pan out were that you're going to uh, have to call someone uh, that, that that's not an issue but yeah uh, it's um, uh, s safety is uh, uh, again everything should be looked through the lens of safety uh, that's uh, um, so 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 uh, y yeah uh, so the other thing uh, is strategic planning. So that's really the next level up. And um, uh, there, there is a bit of strategic planning that happens, uh, again, before you go out. And then there is a strategic planning that, uh, and reevaluating that plan and replanning all the time when you're evaluating in the air. Um, so it's really important to be able to do things on autopilot. So you have your um, uh, brain cells that that are planning and replanning all the time as you're going. Uh, risk management, another important thing. And what I mean by risk here is not really risk of safety again. We covered that. Uh, no, uh, what I mean is really your plan, uh, risk of your plan A not materializing, your plan A not happening. Um, and uh, the risk management there is essentially what we typically say how aggressive you are. And that aggressiveness reflects itself primarily in uh, how fast do you fly between terminals. Um, and uh, actually nowhere else, because you're still, no matter what you are trying to optimize, you're still going to try to climb as fast uh, and mm, as well as you can. But it's really um, that altitude to the next thermal or uh, uh, am I going to be a little higher or a little lower? And um, uh, th that's what, what I mean by risk management. Uh, and that comes from experience. So there is really no, everyone has sort of have, has to discover that for themselves and what works for them. Uh, another important thing that comes from uh, pilot experience is shifting gears. Uh, typically, unless it's that super wimpy, uh, 1,000 kilometer flight, um, you're going to be covering a lot, lots of ground, and you're going to be in different air masses. They're going to be slightly, somewhat different. There, there are going to be some blue holes. There may be overdevelopment, uh, thunderstorms that you have to go around. And the shifting gears is really adjusting that uh, aggressiveness level and uh, taking even the stuff that uh, you had um, 10 knot thermal or 12 knot thermal, and uh, now it doesn't look that good, uh, but I need all the altitude that I can get, uh, and I'm going to take two knots or something like that. So you really have to uh, stay focused on, on the end goal. It's You want to stay flying, uh, and sometimes that also means maybe even retracing back and staying in a good air or changing completely the plan. Um, Local knowledge also comes from pilot experience, and uh, um, this is more of a local knowledge at wider, uh, wider scale. So where to go, routes, altitudes, land out options, um, and uh, so, so that uh, that helps. Um, uh, how you, I mean, how you cross like uh, South Park and uh, Valley or where do you go like um, on wet mountains and uh, so sometimes well most of the times on good days it's, it's quite obvious but uh, um, knowing that and what works in general even when it's 
when it's really super good and there are clouds everywhere, so it almost looks like it, you want uh, typically to take those uh, well-known routes that work even on weaker days because those are going to be better routes in, on a good day anyways. Um, weather patterns, again, uh, knowing uh, our convergence lines, where the house thermals are, uh, we're, uh, again, we, we all know that around here, but then when you start going out, uh, that also happens with um, uh, pilot endurance. Uh, really important. Um, uh, I didn't want to use the word stamina. Like, uh, again, they're almost interchangeable, but uh, endurance has a connotation that there is some hardship involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I it's really important. It's uh, and it starts with physical fitness. So you have to be able to, uh, to 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 sit in cockpit for for that amount of time that we talked about. Um, and um, if you, uh, so, so it re what it really takes is uh, just maybe if you're uh, jogging or biking or hiking and j just do that and be in your really best physical shape. It, it really helps. Um, um, and you have to uh, uh, sustain uh, mental focus throughout the flight. I mean, it's, you're not going to have uh, five minutes uh, to relax and uh, I mean you have to be thinking and re-evaluating re all the time. So your uh, physical fitness is a really important factor in that. And also what that means is uh, um, having food and water intake and the oxygen obviously should be working <laughs> and uh, but uh, food is really important you should be eating during the flight uh, and you don't want to be tired you're going to be making bad decisions so what, what do you recommend for food to bring along oh i i do all kinds of stuff what, stuff whatever i can grab uh, all kinds uh, of what? stuff whatever i can like m m like protein bars or uh, like uh, those uh, hiking bars and uh, uh, sometimes I have uh, like the I don't do that because that, that's a little bit yucky but I use uh, uh, when I'm hungry I would eat that I have that as a, as a backup in my cockpit but uh, like a running gel type of thing that you would uh, suck on uh, so that type of but uh, j just um, yeah it, it, it's uh, again uh, in my Glider actually cockpit is small, so I have uh, actually that restricts my o options. So I cannot take a sandwich really. So so I talk, take really um, nut bars, and sometimes uh, uh, I, I did that a uh, couple times. I just mixed uh, like uh, made my mix of uh, like dry fruit and stuff like that. But then uh, it's uh, um, yeah, inevitable uh, a mess in my cockpit because right. I'm going to have to clean it afterwards. Yeah. So. <laughs> Mice. When, when you get back, you don't want yeah, stuff yeah, that's going to yeah. get mice. So, so water consumption, yeah, it's uh, super important. It's, uh, so, uh, and pilot mindset. So and this gets into basically sport medicine. So be, uh, be in the zone. So you're thinking about what you're going to do next day. And... You have you have it visualized. You, I mean, it's the, all, all of that sports, uh, um, sports uh, psychology type of stuff. Uh, so, so that helps, obviously. I mean, you, you obviously, you can do it if, even if you're not in the zone. But uh, um, and uh, I, I think uh, there are very few flights that I feel I was in the zone. <laughs> but uh, but th that's the goal. Um, uh, confidence again. Uh, it comes from everything that we covered so far, knowing that you are in control of all of that. And first and primarily safety, and that, that that's not something that you're going to uh, really um, compromise at all. Uh, again, gear shifting, uh, so it, we already talked about that. Uh, so, it, And sometimes it's, it's really hard because y you are in the moment and everything is great, but um, it's a sort of a obsessive compulsive type of situation. One, one, one moment you, you are at the top of the world, everything is great. Five minutes later, it's, oh my God, uh, I need to dig myself out, type of thing. Um, so 
obviously you're trying not to get yourself into that, those situations as much and that, that's really this constant planning and replanning and visualizing and looking at, at, at and I talked about be prepared to land up I mean there again uh, if you're doing this it's um, it's a possibility um, okay um, next topic is weather a any questions so far okay I'll just I have one comment regarding water again I had somebody knock into my head a few years ago the fact that it's important to save water toward the end of the flight mm -hmm. because when you're cold if you're cold at altitude your blood vessels are squeezing the water out, yeah. of, your, out of your blood yeah which you're peeing out but then when you come down and it's yes. hot down here then your blood volume expands you can have a lot a, a, a reduction in blood pressure you don't think very clearly so yeah replacing that water is yeah. very important yeah it's so uh, true when you heat up again yeah that's absolutely true so it's really you should you should land with a little leftover water so basically and uh, three liters for this type of duration is about right uh, so I've been thinking about getting one of those three liter camelbacks I just uh, kind of keep uh, using two liter which I have and uh, another half a liter bottle uh, but yeah that, that's absolutely true and the bef also before landing again you uh, you were really in a um, mindset where you were kind of up everything uh, while you're on this long flight everything uh, uh, and, and you're uh, optimizing your speed and distance and what, what not and everything feels differently now when you're trying to land so really drinking before that ahead of time not not just before that but uh, getting yourself in the best shape for that landing is also important because uh, uh, you'll see uh, and I, I know myself I, I have to get myself into oh, I'm landing now and uh, yeah, I need to be super focused on that. And uh, my landings after th that long flight, no matter, I'm trying to do my best, but they are, they are not uh, very rarely. They are like uh, uh, squeakers. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it, you, yeah, I mean, you land safely, and no problem. But uh, uh, and yeah, and also using oxygen. So even when you are at lower altitude, so so it just uh, helps that. Um, uh, so. Um, weather, uh, next topic. So uh, this is uh, what, what I observed. So there are about uh, half a dozen thousand kilometers days per season and every year. Uh, and uh, so, so we are not, again, talking about downwind flights. This is like the, the typical flights that we do here. And that assumes uh, perfect execution. Uh, so, for example, uh, this year I done two flights. One was 700 kilometers, and the other one was 1,000 kilometers. I think that 700 kilometers, had I seen one thing, it would probably have been 900 kilometers. But I didn't see it. I uh, got uh, towards a little later in the day. Got. Uh, outside the band and uh, below the, the working band and then just as I said I uh, saw some great clouds popping up and so there was probably another couple hours of flying there um, so but yeah so it doesn't uh, perfect ex execution uh, some days are just going to be amazing but um, there uh, so, uh, this is like what theoretically can be done so what's needed now? Number one, days being long enough, uh, uh, no or localized overdevelopment. So you cannot have large areas over, of overdevelopment. Obviously, you can have them in one quadrant or whatnot, and then it's going to a totally different place. Uh, and that have, a, I mean, some of these thousand kilometers were really, if you were sit standing on the ground in Boulder, it would be, oh my God, I mean, this, 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 this is, really bad day but just launch get going and um, off to the south uh, going south uh, southwest and it's just amazing and then you just glide back at the end of the day um, uh, so you have to have good lift obviously uh, throughout the day and uh, as I mentioned it's typically mid-may until monsoon uh, but the best part is early July uh, and uh, the most important thing, in my uh, opinion, is whatever system for uh, checking weather or looking weather uh, is 
uh, really observe it and uh, learn from it and calibrate. And what I mean by calibrate is, uh, for example, uh, like you know what the forecast, what the blip map might have mean for today, and you know what really happened. And then you look at the blip map for next day, for tomorrow, and then on a relative uh, scale, you can say, oh, th this is what happened today. So I know that this delta, and if you apply that delta to the day to day, what actually happened, that's actually going to be pretty accurate. Uh, so that's what I meant by this calibrate. And uh, doing that, you also learn what really those charts, uh, weather charts, are really telling you. Um, and it's never perfect. I mean, there are some really great days, but uh, you're always going to do some hard work, especially if you're trying to cover uh, uh, large distances. M well, maybe for that twin people, uh, uh, thousand K maybe, uh, things can set up. But uh, so what I'm going to talk about is really my empirical uh, um, observation of uh, uh, what works best. Um, and uh, this is not to say that there are not other days that are also 1,000 cases, but these are the days that I uh, consistently find to be the best days. So, and uh, I'm going to talk about it in, in a sense in three layers. <laughs> and in the first order, it's, it's really actually simple. So, uh, the, the, what you need to know, will it overdevelop? And th and that's my first question. Uh, and that's really the primary filter, actually. Uh, before even I, uh, I look at um, um, uh, what's, go what, what's the lift going to be. So I look at overdevelopment, and what I mean by overdevelopment is really is it going to be really widespread, so, so the lift uh, dies down, or really large thunderstorms that you cannot really sort of go around, or maybe smaller one that you can sort of go around, but uh, yeah, that you may not want to be doing anyways. Uh, so um, in Boulder, so this is very Boulder specific. So the best days are these mm, prefrontal days. Um, prefrontal meaning uh, called the uh, uh, front coming in. And you can really tell uh, how, what it is just by looking at uh, regular civil forecast. Um, and in the first order, it's like this principally, if it's about time going. <laughs> and, but then you, you want to see the temperature drop for next day. And uh, you want to see mostly sunny. <laughs> and so, so uh, and you want to see low, low precipitation probability. And the day can be windy. Not, not, nothing wrong with that. You'll be working harder, but yeah. Uh, so here is an example. Oh, so this is the the 2016 uh, when uh, Bob's did 1000K and I did. So you can sort of see this was 93 dropping to 87. So this is the day when uh, we all did 1000K. This is the next day that I did 1000K. So you can. It's kind of ha really hard to see there. Uh, but you can uh, see the precipitation, it's I think 20, uh, this may be 10 or 20, and uh, yes, uh, mostly sunny, so, so that, that's what you want to look. And so if you, if you look for something like this, in the first order, seven out of 10 times you're going to be right. Mm -hmm. it, it's as simple as that. And for the, this holds true for Boulder. And this is the 2000, so I just picked like uh, some examples. This is a 2018, so last year when we did this big triangle, which is a little over 900 kilometer triangle, I, I, you'll see it's uh, pretty much the same pattern. So uh, I cannot really read that, but uh, there is a temperature drop uh, with uh, lots of uh, uh, precipitation next day. I, again, high probability, but that's really just the front coming through. Mostly sunny. Sounds like Friday. Yeah. It's Friday. Yes. Yeah. Similar setup. Get well, to, to, tomorrow looks uh, good. Uh, actually, looked good, but it's not. Yeah. Then today looked like uh, probably today was was good. Um, so I mean, actually, so the wind went west. Yeah, wind, and tomorrow is going to be really windy. But uh, it, it, tomorrow is going to be overdeveloping uh, actually. So that that's a problem for tomorrow. I mean, like. A, Significant. That's what it looks. So, so that's in the first order, uh, what they look for. So, um, 
and uh, nowadays I'm in the mode that uh, I really don't, uh, I have very um, limited time and um, if I know enough ahead of time, maybe I can arrange uh, things so I can go and I can go uh, on a good day and so I like to go on a good day. Uh, so, so, I mean, this, this is really my first filter. Then if you want the next level of detail, then what, what I do, I use uh, blitmaps. Uh, and they use the NAM model of blitmaps, so, so that gives us uh, plus two days, so three day forecast. Um, uh, and the first thing that I look there is CAPE. And that's directly uh, related to overdevelopment. So that tells me what's going to happen. Um, and then uh, the other thing that they, uh, the next most significant thing that they look at is the uh, height of critical updraft stand. So how high are thermals going to go? Uh, and the third thing that they look at is wind speed and direction. And this pretty much tells me everything. Uh, the thermal strength is going to be, the height is going to be related to, to thermal strength. So if it's going to 18, 19, 20, I mean, it's going to be good. Uh, but I also look at this, uh, it shows buoyancy shear ratio. And again, uh, I don't really look at it, but it, it's kind of fun to see. Uh, so the other thing that I use is then on the, on the day of the flight, I looked at the thermal soaring uh, forecast. And I'll, I'll show some examples for, for all those days. Uh, so in, in there, uh, I look for trigger time, and I look, look for freezing level. And those are the two main things that I look for. So freezing level, just uh, if you're flying with water, you should know. Uh, about the other, uh, what altitude is going to be freezing, and then I would uh, load my glider accordingly. I almost always put um, uh, RV antifreeze in my tail because that's such a small volume. Um, I would put some early in the season, May time frame, April May uh, uh, in the wings. Now it, it gets expensive, but uh, if you are going to carry water. Uh, I mean, put a few gallons and calculate really what my um, freezing, uh, assuming like a linear uh, mixing type of thing that it's going to change it linearly and can kind of figure out. But it changes, and by, by doing that, maybe you're changing the freezing point uh, by a few degrees. But I, I, I'm not sure if that has uh, uh, really any effect. But the, the, in the tail, it's important, so I would put really like pretty much, uh, if, it, if it's going to be cold, I put half of it, uh, uh, RV antifreeze. Um, um, and finally, forecast chart, and I'll show what, what I mean by the forecast chart there. So here is the blip map, so, so that's that uh, 2016, where uh, you had multiple thousand case on that same day. So this is, um, this is Cape. So uh, everyone, I guess everyone knows how to read this. Uh, so we are right here. So you can see the mountains. So we are about 40 degrees latitude. Uh, so these are the mountains. So you, you can sort of see that there is going to be, I mean, it looks like there is going to be stuff that's going to be building up uh, later. And, and the, the blip maps uh, give you um, uh, forecast in the middle of the soaring day, roughly. So, but it, it, it's good enough to, to get the idea. And uh, you see, I mean, this is all kind of blowing up really here. Uh, but uh, going so towards uh, New Mexico, really, uh, and these are Sangres here, and so it's kind of going to be blowing up. Um, and then uh, uh, the this is the uh, thermal height. So again, we are here, so you can see a lot of white, and so this this looks really good. So Bob Bob Caldwell did uh, essentially. Uh, border to border, so he went all the way here and all the way back and then back. And that's actually a really good plan for this day, uh, when you see something like this. Uh, this is going to be blowing up probably midday or later in the day, but it's really going to be working early in during the day, and so Bob took advantage of that. And I, I'm going to show you this as a few more examples. So, and then you can see the wind is not, not too bad, uh, again, you don't want 
too much yellow, but, but I mean, if there is if there is red, then that becomes a real challenge. But uh, uh, or orange or red on the blue plant, and but again, uh, shows really consistent lift throughout. Uh, so that's that day, and then uh, again this um, soaring forecast. Um, you can see the height, thermal height. I think this is saying you know, almost 19,800 or something. I cannot quite read it. Uh, uh, time of trigger temperature. So when things are going to start, I cannot read that. But that's the uh, other thing that I I read from here. So it's kind of shortcut. But in the first order, actually, it works well. So so this is uh, reasonably accurate. So I normally launch before this. Uh, it, it starts working be always pretty much before it, but that's what I meant by calibrate. So you kind of observe, uh, you do it once, and uh, um, mm -hmm. you, you sort of learn to trust uh, the whatever the model is that they are using here. Um, is that the thermal soaring forecast, the National Weather Service? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is for both, <laughs> okay. specifically. Uh, freezing level, I think this is saying 16.5 or something, something like that. Oh, let me see if I can maybe read it on the screen. Uh, time of trigger, that's 11. In time of, uh, oh yeah, the next, ne next thing is time of overdevelopment. So, so this is a point forecast for Boulder. So it says done, which is what you would expect uh, looking at the Cape chart there. Um, the forecast, uh, the synoptic chart, and this is very typical what you'll see. Again, so we're about here. Uh, you'll see high pressure, which is kind of counterintuitive in uh, other parts of the world. Uh, yeah, if you have hard, high pressure, it's probably not going to be such a great storm. But you have this cold front coming in, and interestingly, you have this trough. And if you say, see trough, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> so, uh, well, pretty much, it just by observing most of those really the best days, uh, almost always have that trough, and it has to do with uh, just the general buoyancy of the air. It almost feels like the there is more rising air than sinking air, mm -hmm. and it's it's in wider areas but when when you have a setup like yes. this. So here are the, again, the flights of that day. So this is Bob going to um, New Mexico, going back to Wyoming and coming back. And so he, he went on Sangres here, I think, uh, no, he, he went on Wet Mountains. Uh, I mean, this is always interesting hop here. Uh, come, come back on Sangre over Blanca. Um, uh, you know, west side of South Park Valley, and then this is just kind of local, almost. Uh, and I did go really, I, I was more, you can see more, uh, so this is m my way out. And you'll see typically, again, going out, you'll be more east, obviously, because you are not climbing uh, 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 the tops of thermal uh, You are lower in general, so, so y you are keeping your uh, options um, more open for, for landing out and stuff. Uh, and then just coming back, so about uh, New Mexico, and then just did this type of thing. And Bob Ferris, I think he went th this way, you, you can sort of see it, and then went way out west, and then cut back uh, with the tail, and came back with the tailwind. Um, so, uh, that's so that's right. And the reason the trough situation works well is because you have air from the high pressure area streaming into the low pressure yeah. area. Yeah. 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 And uh, so this is from last year uh, when, when it is this big uh, uh, 900 uh, kilometer triangle. And this day actually didn't work quite how I expected. So there was an, uh, I wanted actually to go to go south first, uh, but there was uh, like a cirrus all the way, and it didn't. Uh, oh, sorry, all the way uh, to the south, and um, it, it looked bleak. But uh, I launched, and then uh, I saw way out there, kind of almost uh, Owl Canyon. I saw some puffs uh, forming, and said, "Well, that's where I'm going." So I essentially went went 
out uh, north and then out east and get come came uh, uh, I'll show you in the next slide but this is pretty good I mean it's really you see it's you, you get cape that's purple uh, like 90% purple with few little things that, that that's a, that's a really good thing um, and you can almost see that again my plan was just looking at this was to go out south but it's actually this part that worked well in the morning uh, what, what I initially planned was not not good but th uh, that was a flight that uh, amazingly when, when, when I when I uh, decided to do that and started, everything felt in place. I mean, uh, it was amazing from that perspective because it almost never works like that. It always have to adjust. So, and that was exactly a plan to go out to the east, go, and I went almost to the Rollins here. And then uh, there was later in the day, essentially there was a big blow up in this area, which is exactly what you would expect when you look at this, uh, at, at the Cape here. Um, I, I forgot about that because my plan was to go, but um, I kind of went as far as I would. Uh, I would there. Again, very consistent. Um, the interesting thing, let me actually mention. Uh, oh yeah, and th there was quite a bit of wind, so so this was a very slow lag going this way. Um, uh, the interesting thing, um, if you look at thermal strength. You see these blobs, like like this one, and they sort of don't make sense. If it's and it's really a high point, so why would that? Uh, why would that there be uh, um, not good lift in that area? So that makes no sense. What's actually happening? You, can, you if you look there and cross correlate with Cape, that's the area that's going to overdevelop really by the time model model thinks it's going to overdevelop and the lift is going to be that by the mid the day when the model what the model was for so you know, even on a really good days you're going to see these little like holes uh, and typically it's about high peaks um, and that uh, that means it's going to blow there but actually that's a good piece of information and what it really means yeah go there first because it's going to be really good there mm -hmm. and uh, then you are on your way then there is it's not so good and there it's really good mm -hmm. uh, later in the day so uh, I don't have that uh, again for this uh, day I didn't save that um, synoptic chart but it's uh, you can sort of see what it is so it was kind of tiptoeing this way and then going downwind uh, and they're going upwind and big le leg all the way to that overdevelopment and back. Um, and let me see if I can read any of that. Uh, no, it's. You monitoring your radar on your phone? No, no. I, I, it's really uh, these days tend to be so. Uh, again, uh, I used to look at SQT. And w what you normally want to see on SQT is like that Y type of shape, so dew point uh, diverging uh, from, from the temperature. And what that means is that that upper air is uh, really dry. Essentially, Cape is telling you that same information. Um, so it's not going to be huge overdevelopment. It's going to overdevelop in very small uh, localized areas just because it's so strong. And it starts sucking and everything goes up. And obviously, it, then it condenses and pulls down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but uh, it, it, it's because of that. So it's really, uh, you almost don't, uh, so these, these type of days, uh, you don't really need weather, it's all visual. And they, there are days when, when you, oh, having radar would be absolutely great, but uh, I, I don't use it. I don't have, uh, I'm, I'm not used to it. So th th that's in the second order, and that's really 99% uh, of time what, what I really look. And most recently I just started uh, looking at sky site, and this is just getting a little extra detail in terms of time for progression, how things are going to develop during the day, where convergence lines are, and streeting type of thing. So, 
So I just started using that and calibrating my understanding of that model. So I'm not trusting it yet, but uh, it, it's actually nice because you can sort of play through the day and see how things are going to move and make your plan accordingly. Um, okay, any questions about weather? Do you, do you take any of those any charts with you or notes or anything if you're making a plan you know no and that's just primarily me i make a plan <laughs> I, I, and uh, i'm going to take a talk about that a little bit but uh, i make plan plan a and I, then i make plan b as well just if that uh, is not going to work so i make that uh um, pretty much day prior and then uh, in the morning, I really, just before I launch, uh, I look at the sky with having that information in clear mind. Um, and uh, so then decide, well, plan A is, looks good. So that's, that's your plan, you yeah. make the plan? Yeah, make the plan, and yeah. Just, uh, yeah. all up here. Yeah, okay. yeah. Kind of on that note, how do you do it from a task standpoint? I mean, do you have like A task, B task, C task, so, save your computer? So, or? okay, so again, uh, going back to the basic uh, definition of the problem. So this is OLC, so you're not flying to a turn point, so you're flying to a general area. Mm -hmm. And so, so, yeah, I know how far I want to go. Uh, but I also, because OLC is really nice, again, it gives you um, a lot of flexibility because you can just go and keep going if it's good. Yeah. Uh, but then you have to decide when you turn back. Uh, so, so you definitely, so sometimes I would just stretch it a um, little bit that way or this way type of thing. But you can keep it really flexible actually okay. with OLC. So, uh, so no big deal. So uh, I think actually, yeah, so that's what it just thought. Uh, so baseline plan and option B. Um, so flexibility to adapt and the plan, and, um, yeah, it would change. So it's, again, you're not flying a pre-declared task to a point, so it's a, it's a lot easier, actually, uh, because uh, the point that you choose may be in, um, in a sinky area or something. But uh, h having this information and flying on these days, you, you can actually make a really good, uh, good task. I, I, I think, uh, I think I can make a good task to a point where you fly within 500 meters of that point and come back, like a, a tra traditional racing task. And uh, really, again, the, these are the best days that we, we see here. Uh, again, I wouldn't put uh, uh, like that point uh, above Can Canyon City uh, because it's going to be sinky there, but uh, it may be just like if you are uh, deciding for a task and how to optimize it, so you, you may put it really like on the someplace, uh, money to Springs or west side of Pikes Peak and, and then go back and th that, that type of thing so you can give, give yourself. But I wouldn't, for example, put it on top of Pikes Peak late in the day because it's going to be, there is going to be some overdevelopment under some typically. Uh, they are almost for certain on, on a good day. Uh, so, yeah, so you need to know your expected speed, um, again, and uh, you can see these speeds, I, again, they were between 120 and 158 or something, so it's a not uh, a huge variation, but uh, um, you, you can plan how, how uh, what your legs should be based on that, and you, you, you can know your your own capabilities, how, how fast you can fly. I mean, if it's 100, uh, 100 uh, kilometers an hour, yeah, that's fine, and you can still do it, but uh, yeah, but uh, you decide how far you want to go based on that. Um, so phases of flight, and this, is, this goes to that gear shifting, so it's, again, you're covering a lot of time as well as a lot, you know, a lot of distance. So it's going to be very different. So early on, it's going to be in in general, uh, it's going to be weak, and the thermals going going to be far apart, and uh, so it's going to be hard work. You're not going to be able to climb very high, and so you have to take that into account, and you should be aggressive early on. Uh, and then middle of the day, everything is going to, I mean, it's going to be just. Great, no overdevelopment and things starting to build up, um, and um, you are cruising and uh, you are as aggressive as you as you dare to be. Uh, and then later in the day, uh, things are starting to die down, but uh, uh, at that time, uh, things are starting also to be more lined up, and um, 
you 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 can be uh, flying uh, cruising slower and you are going to have a very very long day, uh, legs but uh, uh, again your indicated speed is going to be lower but uh, you are going to be making a really really good speed uh, overall and uh, then if you're trying to squeeze as much out of the day then it becomes uh, starts be being really really hard so there is really that uh, get high stay high uh, later in the day uh, uh, rationale and if you fell, fall out of that working band w later in the day, typically I mean you're landing uh, landing back or uh, wherever you are. So, uh, what are some of the challenges? So, I mean this is uh, um, I just put a bunch of things so I can maybe people can uh, help me with uh, adding more things. But uh, it's never really what you plan as far as the weather. It all looks good and it gives you a really rough plan. But when you're in the air, it's not going to be quite that. Uh, um, so you'll, you'll have to adapt. So that, that's, that's the point. Uh, it may be a blue day. And actually, I tend to like those very strong blue days because around here, they are never really blue. Uh, you're going to have little things that are, uh, uh, I mean, if you have good polarized glasses, you'll be able to see them. And uh, that's where the best, best stuff is. And so it sort of removes the clutter of every, all the misinformation <laughs> that you may get if, if, there, if there are too many clouds. So, so there are some really, really good days. So obviously, if, you are, if it's a blue day and you are uh, starting early, uh, as you should, that first part is going to be really hard. But then during the middle of the day is actually amazing. Um, so other challenges are overdeveloped, thunderstorms, Virga, so that's uh, not uncommon. So both days that I flew this year, there, there was quite a bit of Virga. That first day it was uh, a, a lot, it, it, it was all safe. But you had to work hard, uh, actually going around it, and um, uh, yeah. And it, it, there was always a, a route around it, and there, there was no, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, but it, it it essentially boiled down to uh, hard work on both days. Uh, again, coming large uh, areas, you're going to encounter different air masses. Typically, when you're going north, as an example. Uh, into Laramie Valley, it's going to be windy, it's going to be very different. It may look the same, uh, and uh, I don't know how many times I got uh, sucked up into the valley because it looks, I mean, it's so great here and it looks about the same, and it's not at all. And then you have to work hard to, to get back, and that really hop back into the going, uh, coming back south towards Boulder. Um, is actually tends to be a hard hop. Uh, why, why is that? Because several people have told me this before. Yeah, it, uh, you, you'll see really almost all that, that that's, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, all those good days, there is always, it's always wind, more windy there. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the wind that we get here is really, uh, because it hits the mountains and uh, it's sort of part of it turns into a lift that we like. Mm -hmm. And there, because it's more flat and uh, just by the nature, mm -hmm. um, it, it tends to be more windy, and, but it, it's stronger as well. So yes, yeah, so so, so th that's one thing that uh, that I learned. So um, blue holes typically are going to again. I mean, you may encounter blue holes if you want to make uh, some long lag. Uh, so you may have to reconnect with another patch of clouds uh, um, uh, someplace, and. Um, um, yeah, that, that's not uncommon, especially going uh, going, going south. Uh, so, so like uh, from General Pike's Peak, and if you are trying to go towards Pueblo and not stay in the wet uh, uh, mountains, uh, um, and, and there might be really amazingly good conditions, like towards Spanish Peaks, uh, but th there there tends to be a, a blue hole there that you so you just climb as high as you can and uh, glide that you're. Uh, Best best glide that you uh, to to make it to make it over. So so how far do you want to go? So what if the day dies early and that happens? 
and that, that's mo most commonly the reasons for landouts are really you are too far and you can not quite make it or you got stuck uh, or uh, just over development and uh, you just have to land there uh, uh, terrain obviously is our uh, thing so you, you need to really know, uh, understand it how it all works and in the mountains uh, you, you always need to be able pretty much to glide out uh, so there are not many good options. Um, class B, obviously we cannot really <laughs> go east. <laughs> uh, I mean, when we say east, that's, that really means northeast. And that the good days for going northeast are, uh, tend to be in May time frame. Come, come July almost, I've never seen a good, a good day. And th then you can get some later in, the, in uh, late August and September, you, you get some absolutely great days there. But again, uh, September is already, uh, the days are too short, so uh, 1,000 K uh, would be really hard. And TFRs, uh, so we had some years when we had TFRs all over, uh, and you just have to, to uh, uh, know about them and go around, uh, around them or above them. Uh, yeah, so tips and tricks, so this is like a catch-all for everything else. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, risk management and statistics, yeah, so again, uh, if you're aggressive and consistently aggressive, some of those risks are going to materialize. I mean, that's what you just what the statistics <laughs> is. So be, uh, uh, yeah, so be careful about that. Uh, so that's actually, I think, uh, one thing that I started doing, I'm, uh, I am more, I become more risk averse. Uh, so risk management, this is not the safety risk, again, this is the risk of pl plan A not materializing. Um, so I'm now tend to make it easy on me, as easy as I can, and, and uh, obviously it helps if you start early, then you can go farther, and you're going to work hard early, but you can go far. But it's also very important to go fast. So those are um, those are sort of conflicting goals. So it's kind of finding the the right <laughs> uh, uh, right point I is uh, is is a tricky thing. Let's see how they switch. Uh, um, I want to show this chart here. So in terms of risk management, so these are. Uh, all those thousand k flights. So these are the speeds for all of them, and you can really see the clear trend of overall speed coming down. And I think <laughs> so. Is this your flights or all? And so all of them. So so this is John Seaborn. So uh, again, uh, and I, this is Bob Ferris. This is me. This is John uh, Seaborn uh, again. Um, but and, and this is mostly me and uh, I think Bob, Bob uh, Caldwell and Bob Ferris are someplace in here. Uh, but uh, again, it, it, even if I took those out, it doesn't really make much difference. I mean, there is this uh, clear trend, so I'm kind of, uh, which is uh, really we used to do, so, so there, uh, I think there, there are several factors. So one factor was that early on there, there were uh, spread apart, and so we, when John did it, it was a really good day, when Bob, uh, Carl did it, it was uh, an amazing day, and so we did them uh, just on really good days, and uh, um, you know, tended to be more aggressive, but the days were good, and, but so, so what I'm trying to say, in here there are some days that are not as good on average, so that's reflected in this uh, overall, uh, 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 Speed. The, 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 there is also um, an, an, uh, so so there is definitely an aspect of me be being more risk averse uh, as well. And then there is another uh, factor which is probably that uh, uh, now knowing how to do them, I also uh, try. Uh, I'm. Uh, Launching earlier and staying longer, so I'm getting more of a bad part of the day, not so good part of the day. So that reduces the overall uh, the overall speed. 
So, so some of that is reflected because I now tend to, uh, I have one goal, I, I want to kind of do uh, uh, 1250, which is, I think, doable. But to do that, you have to really milk it out. And I've been doing that. And uh, also, even when, when it's clear I'm not going to be able to do it, I want to stay as late so I can learn as much about the day as possible. Uh, so so that, that, that's also a factor. So, but this uh, risk, risk aversion I, uh, is definitely reflected in this. Um, and so tips and tricks. Uh, so, so the other thing is uh, uh, just in general, uh, to make it easier on you, you want to uh, do your first leg starting down in obviously the day. It's just starting, it's not great. So you want to fly the upwind leg later when, when, when the lift is better, obviously. So, so that would bias that mm, baseline plan. Uh, another thing is you want to go to the, those areas of overdevelopment that are shown really very So I see Cape, be there uh, and be gone. Uh, and another tip and trick <laughs> is tow direction and start point. So based on that, you want to, uh, knowing where you want to go, uh, you just basically want to be in there and be, uh, start flying for as long as you want, as you can, which means starting er as early as possible. So you want to tow into the lift, number one, uh, but you also uh, are thinking about your start point. So say Boulder is here and they want to go north first. So in that case, I would typically tow to the south uh, for the reason that, uh, assuming everything looks the same. I, if, if I'm seeing really crap to the, uh, uh, to the south and really good stuff to the north, then uh, I wouldn't be doing that. But everything being the same, I, I would, go south, and that would be my start point. So number one, uh, uh, when, when you're doing that, you're maximizing your first leg distance, which is really important because again, we are trying to do six segments, uh, and it's, um, uh, so the segments later in the day are going to be, tend to be smaller. Uh, uh, the other, the other uh, reason why that's uh, also a very good idea is uh, basically you're flying across boulders, so you're not so concerned about landing out yeah. because uh, if, uh, you're, you're, you're just going to come back and um, yeah, uh, uh, you just did a long dart, uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> uh, and, and, but if you, if you, you're, you want, want to go north and you are already uh, just, uh, then you don't really have that option, but it gives you that option, feeling the air, learning, and uh, really being, being reasonably aggressive, safely aggressive, uh, safely in, in terms of the, the risk management uh, early on. So uh, phases of flight, so already talked about that. So again, hard work early on and typically great, but you still need to maintain the same mental focus and you want to be really making as much distance during that time. You want to be really maximizing the day all the time. Um, and uh, milking it at the end of the day. And so <laughs> uh, late in the day, we. Uh, around here have a convergence and that's really probably the easiest actually part of the flight uh, again given the OLC rules you can do this uh, it's kind of goes into that wimpy category <laughs> but uh, you can do it and it's a fair thing to do <laughs> but um, it's not going to be an epic flight and it's going to get <laughs> I don't know <laughs> not an A <laughs> uh, but uh, so w what happens you get the convergence or li really weak wave and uh, for a really large area and you can just sit in it and it's so beautiful and you're watching I mean some, some coming down and you're just cruising and enjoying it and going s slow and the uh, 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 Sometimes uh, if I um, really need to get even more distance and uh, the day is dying and uh, it's really, again, almost no lift, but there is this teeny tiny bit of lift and I find it, uh, I would dump my water and just climb up. 
because I, assuming there is enough of the day to still uh, make the distance that I may get from that. So again, that's really in that milking it category. Um, you want to maximize the first leg distance that makes the whole thing a lot easier. Uh, then uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility what you're going to do <coughs> and uh, change your plan. Uh, uh, if you have to go around over development, obviously, uh, what it usually most of the time means uh, is really going west. You always want to go around it on the upwind side uh, because going downwind, uh, you're, if you may be able to get away with it, uh, but if it doesn't work, you're landing out typically. Um, so yeah, uh, around over going around the overdevelopment is not uh, un unusual and uncommon. So that's um, again essentially we talked about timing, weather development, or overdevelopment. Uh, and uh, if you if you see uh, things building up and that you're not going to make it or you're going to be late for it, yeah, don't don't try going there. Or if you if you see uh, again, it goes to uh, there. There are all kinds of considerations there. How aggressive you want? Uh, if you go fl fly faster, can you make it? If you're just pu push the nose down, and but yeah, the, there is a lot of that that I do. So I just watch what's happening uh, and um, um, just at that tactical level, uh, really. No, adjusting where I'm going. Um, uh, and this goes to that endurance and the being fresh for the whole flight. I now pretty much uh, rig the day before. I don't want to be assembling my glider and then uh, for from two reasons. I'm going to be tired uh, and uh, I want all the energy I can get, have, uh, but also everything that I find that's uh, wrong there is really no opportunity to fix. Uh, so, so I typically would uh, rig and fill the water uh, day before and just park it there. And then it's, uh, I take care of uh, those little squawks that I found uh, the day before when I rigged it uh, in the morning. Uh, I mean, fill the oxygen, things, that, that type of thing. But I'm not doing anything major. Um, incremental learning. That's super important. So everyone is at a certain level, and but uh, yeah, I mean there there is a lot <laughs> in this, uh, uh, but uh, you you learn little by little, and you you the the other important uh, 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 factor is learn about yourself, <laughs> and that's most important because uh, number one safety is going to come from that, and uh, um, yeah, uh, so. Uh, Go where it's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't be set on, be set on whatever the task it is. Uh, so again, th that's the OLC flexibility that we we have. We talked talked about blue days. Uh, again, uh, we don't get get those very often when when it's so strong, but we do get some. Um, so where to turn? Uh, then you make your turn point to be coming back. Uh, again, I, I've been talking about a lot like uh, it's more, more uh, north-south, which a lot of time it is. But uh, what, whatever it is, so you, you, you're, you're going uh, uh, obviously into the wind or downwind, whichever way. But uh, uh, for OLC flights, it's really easy because you can get to the edge of that cloud or get to that last cloud and then uh, turn. And then obviously you want to be, um, if you are going um, upwind, uh, um, you, you don't really, again, uh, you don't even need to worry about uh, turning upwind low, the typical things that you would do and going down, uh, turning downwind high. Uh, because uh, OLC, you just go to that last uh, uh, last cloud, last thermal, and you are climbing in it, and that's typically your turn. So again, it's both upwind and downwind. So you're uh, you're maximizing it. Uh, so so it, 
be becomes easy. But kind of, uh, I used to do that m more in the past that I would get to that last cloud and then, uh, and I, I do that to some degree uh, still. Uh, if, if, it, if it looks, it's kind of the street that's kind of still building up and th there is more stuff there, yeah, I, I would go out in the blue. But uh, m more often than not, you are at the edge of good, uh, good air when you're mm -hmm. seeing that. Mm -hmm. uh, when to leave thermal, that, that's always, again, uh, you need to be fast, so you don't want to dawdle around. Uh, so when it starts, uh, again, um, if, if you're in the happy mode, uh, then, uh, you, yeah, um, don't go to 18 or 75 and go to, well, 16.5 or 17, and uh, you're just going to be bumping it along and you'll be in 75 or soon enough, uh, just bumping it along. Um, if you are under good air, so so it's really you don't really want to overstay uh, that. Um, and uh, again, when to thermal, uh, being in the, uh, that uh, lower part of working band, but not lower than it. That's really important. So. Uh, uh, closer you get to that, slower you should be cruising, obviously, but slower your speed is going to be. So you really want to avoid putting yourself in that situation. Uh, so, um, and, and end of day uncertainty, so that, that, that's also a big one because, uh, again, you're trying to squeeze as much time out of the day. But also if you're doing this milking um, back and forth the uh, north south that's actually really i mean again you're in the gliding range and uh, it's like super easy so but if you are kind of doing out and return and uh, that uh, become that, that that's a big deal uh, super important uh that's it <laughs> I know you mentioned dolphin flying earlier, yeah. but when you're not dolphin flying, are you flying like a set McCready or is it more just gears that you kind of have in your Yeah, body? it's those like three speeds, uh, mm -hmm. like default, uh, uh, happy on that, not so happy. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we, yeah, 85, 95, 100, uh, 100 yeah. yeah, in my glider. With, with, without with, with water, or without or water, yeah. it's about 10, uh, 10 less yeah. or so. Uh, yeah, yeah the, again, it's, uh, uh, it's you don't. I mean, like a couple knots are going not, not going to make a big difference. It's really making a little turn uh, to be in a little better lift makes a bigger bigger difference. Yeah. It sounds difference. like a lot of energy line flying versus yeah. traditional. Yeah, it is absolutely stuff. absolutely. What what motivates you after <laughs> after twenty you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, thousand kilometer flights? To well, I always try to do to, to to do different things. So mm -hmm. so it's uh, um, I, as I mentioned, I like to establish that uh, uh, upper limit on, of on, of wimpiness <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I want to do twelve fifty, and that's hard. Uh, so so it's um, yeah, that's running ag against our limits uh, typically. Well, or it, 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 you went you went all around the thing by space. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, flights, yeah, so. yeah. So so. So yeah, I have a whole list of things in, uh, that I would like to do, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I definitely would like to do a thousand kilometer triangle. But, uh, again, that's hard, uh, again, given our um, our geometry. I mean, th there are really two choices. One one is like that flight, and the other one is kind of doing the mirror image to, to the south. So. How, how much experience did you have before you did your first 1,000 Uh when did I do it? It was like 2008, so like eight years or so. Oh, yeah, nine years. Okay, eight How years. Many hours? How many hours? Oh, uh, I, uh, well, really, uh, our hours wouldn't be meaningful because I did so much instruction. Uh, so, so there were lots of instruction hours, uh, which really don't help you in that sense. Uh, but um, pro I, I probably had a couple thousand hours. But it, it was a lot of instruction, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, like maybe, I don't know, several hundred hours of instruction a year for a bunch of years. So.
Very good. Very good. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so thank much. You so much. Yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll send the link to the slides.